And joining us in the studio now for tonight's Your Health segment is Dr. Paul Fishman, professor of neurology at the University of Maryland School of Medicine and director of the Alzheimer's Center at the University of Maryland Medical Center. Doctor, thank you for being with us. Well, it's good to be here. Read that there are five million people with Alzheimer's in the United States. Is that number, um, obviously it's a big number, how much of that is just the aging of the population? A lot of it is the aging of the population because the, may, the strongest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is age. And particularly as our population ages, what we used to consider old, you know, between 65 and 75, uh, now we're seeing a large numbers of people, 75 to 85 and above. And Alzheimer's disease gets more and more common, uh, literally doubling with each five years of, of age after age 65. So we see a very large proportion, about 40 to 50 percent of people over 80 have Alzheimer's disease. Uh, is it normal to get a little bit fuzzier as we get older? When, when is that normal? When is it a disease? Well, Alzheimer's disease in some ways is defined by the setting you see it in. When we talk about dementia, dementia is a general term for loss of thinking abilities. We're concerned when it reaches a level to interfere with either occupational functioning or social functioning. And uh, a small amount of, of forgetfulness, uh, especially uh, time-related forgetfulness. You're driving home, uh, I'm supposed to pick up bread and milk on my way home. I get home, my wife will say, where's the milk and the bread? Uh, that, again, that's not Alzheimer's disease. That really is more, uh, probably I was preoccupied. And people have to remember that many things affect memory, uh, not just this progressive brain disease that's Alzheimer's disease. And if, but if it, it's at the point that's interfering with somebody's day-to-day -day life, it's probably a good idea to see a physician about that because there'll be many things that may be correctable besides Alzheimer's disease. In our society, things that influence memory, depression, anxiety, sleep deprivation, medications. There are very few medications that improve memory. There are lots of medications that interfere with memory. How often do you see it being one of those things as opposed to the Alzheimer's disease? Particularly in younger people. I think younger people, uh, and what I, I guess younger people change every year as I get older, uh, but uh, in general in people you know, below the age of 60, uh, particularly without a strong family history of Alzheimer's disease, there's an enormous concern and preoccupation. And a lot of times you find these reversible causes uh, in the younger populations. On the other side of the coin, there are many elderly uh, living almost semi-independently now in the 80s and above because what happens in those patients who do have Alzheimer's disease, their insight, their self-awareness is impaired. And they'll have to be brought by family members. They don't see a problem at all uh, until they're, they're driving, they've cracked up their car, they've gotten uh, speeding tickets, uh, or for going too slow. They've, they've stopped paying their bills. They're not shopping anymore. And it's family members that say, this is something wrong here. And they may be dismissive about it. You know, I'll have patients who literally can't read simple commands, but they're adjusting their glasses, you know, uh, maybe it's, it's my glasses, I didn't hear you correctly, but it doesn't matter, you know, how big the print is and how large I spoke. They really don't have a lot of self-awareness. And self-awareness is very variable in Alzheimer's disease. Some people can be self-aware at times, other times be totally dismissive. And, uh, and they can have, whether or not they're self-aware or not, anxiety and depression can really interfere with their day-to-day -day lives. Let me uh, remind our viewers, if you have a question about Alzheimer's or related conditions, you can give us a call. We'll have the number up on the screen. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about the diagnosis of Alzheimer's, which has always been a little bit difficult, a little bit subjective maybe. You can amplify that. But you also brought a couple of pictures of some new brain imaging that, that may be able to help. What, what are we looking at here? Well, what you're looking at are uh, MRI slices of the brain. And these are very high resolution, more than the usual clinical MRI, and they're used for research purposes. And the green area is an area called the hippocampus. It's a brain area that's probably one of the most important centers for retention of memory. Uh, and it's 
affected in early Alzheimer's disease, and it shrinks, it loses, it atrophies, uh, deteriorates over the years that go on, and it's correlated with the progression of Alzheimer's disease. So you can measure the size of it. There was a second slide that was looking at uh, a certain type of imaging. Well, the, what defines Alzheimer's disease are abnormal, almost crystalline-like deposits in the brain called amyloid. And uh, these crystalline-like deposits, this is what Alzheimer's saw 100 years ago examining patients. At autopsy. At autopsy. Right. But now there are scans, and about for at least the last decade that have been available on a research level, that actually you can image those amyloid deposits within the brain. And what's well known is those deposits can be detectable long before someone has any difficulty with memory. And, uh, and then the question is, do you want to know that? Uh, well, there are two reasons. The research community is very interesting, interested in knowing that. Because right now, there is no effective therapy to prevent people from getting Alzheimer's disease, particularly as if they begin to have symptoms. And one of the reasons that many scientists feel that the therapies haven't been effective is that the biology of the disease, the changes in the brain, have already uh, started to occur. We know that from animals, that once these deposits form, they're hard to reverse. So these are very effective research tools. Now, one of them, the very similar to this amyloid, the colored scan, is for the last few months has been available commercially. And it's still really shaking out. Let me, uh, uh, let's grab a phone call. Sure. Uh, here, this is Maggie in Baltimore City. Maggie, thanks for the phone call. Go ahead. Hello, Maggie. Maggie, are you there? All right. Um, the, the idea of testing pre symptoms. What's the feeling in the medical community about that? Well, as I said, for research purposes, it's great. But, to but identify now you said it's commercially for clinical available. ones, uh, I, in general, discourage it. It's a specific situation. Somebody's clearly impaired, and Alzheimer's disease is only one of several reasons for that impairment. There are other dementias. Uh, multiple small or large strokes called vascular dementias. There are other ones that have different pathology, and this scan can, uh, can diagnose it. Uh, sometimes people are depressed or anxious, and it's not clear if they actually do have Alzheimer's disease. That's the utility of it. For someone who just says, I had a mother with Alzheimer's disease, uh, I'm worried I might be developing it, uh, I don't think they're useful because uh, it may be years to decades, if at all, that person will develop symptoms. Let's talk to Mike in Prince George's County. Mike, thanks for calling. Go ahead. I'd like to ask uh, the doctor, does uh, aerobic exercise or playing a musical instrument, does that help? Good call. Mike, thank you very much. How about doing some puzzles? Well. The first part is that there's no consensus that there's something that will keep you from getting Alzheimer's disease or for a dementia. Uh, the evidence is nowhere near as good for cardiovascular health and heart health. Saying that, uh, there's a lot of evidence that heart health and brain health are related, uh, exercise being one of those things. If you look at people who have had a lifetime of vigorous exercise, there's far less Alzheimer's disease in that population. Does that mean if uh, at my age, if I started strenuously exercising now, would it benefit me? Probably not. Let's get to another phone call. Maria in Frederick County. Maria, thanks for calling. Go ahead. Yes, I, my question is, uh, my grandmother had Alzheimer's, my mother passed away from Alzheimer's, and I had a severe head injury when I was young. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, what is, is, is there, how do, I, how do I describe it? Is there a concern that I may develop it? Um, Maria, thank you for the question. We'll get you an answer on the air. Thank sure. you. Well, there's really a concern for everyone as the age of getting Alzheimer's disease, whether or not you do or do not have a family history. And then in family history, since age is such a powerful factor, it means at what age did those relatives develop symptoms? We are very concerned about people who have a family history where in their 60s uh, people are developing Alzheimer's disease. And, uh, but uh, anyone who has a, a family history of longevity 
is probably going to have a family history of Alzheimer's disease. The other aspect is all bad things that happen to the brain uh, are somewhat additive. Uh, and uh, in general, we tell patients to, if you're hypertensive, treat it. If you have diabetes, treat it. All of good health practices, if you have a risk of Alzheimer's disease, are probably all the more important. Well, that's probably a good place to, to leave it with some good advice from Dr. Paul Fishman of the University of Maryland Medical Center. Doctor, thank you for being with us. Oh, good.